Um, so today, I want us to continue with the, uh, the, uh, the Second World War. And uh, I do want to, there was a video clip uh, link on there that I, some had said was difficult to see on their iPad. So I want to show that in class. And then also um, just a little bit about uh, Pearl Harbor as well. Give you some time to work on this activity, which is due uh, today. So that'll be kind of like our, our agenda. But to stay with, you know, the trend of what I have done the past couple of days, this is uh, Black History Month. And so today I want to focus on uh, Dr. May uh, Jemson. And, uh, and this is uh, focusing on NASA. And last night, actually, uh, once I got done with all the drama with my son and everything, I sat down and channel surfed. And on the Smithsonian Channel, uh, they actually had a spotlight on uh, NASA and uh, African American history or African Americans uh, and their role in NASA and the 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 process of um, one would say desegregating uh, the NASA agency. So I thought that was interesting. So kind of connected here as well. Doctor and astronaut, born in uh, Georgia in 1956, moved to Chicago for a better education. Uh, liked uh, astronomy here. And in Chicago, they have a planetarium. Went to Stanford, involved in dance, theater, uh, Black Student Union, uh, degree in chemical engineering, all right? Went on to Cornell Medical, studied in Cuba, Kenya, and worked at a refugee camp in uh, Thailand. Became Peace Corps doctor in Sierra Leone in Liberia. So very active. Uh, in 1985, uh, her career did change and one of 15 chosen from 2000 to train with NASA. So um, not always a slam dunk and sometimes uh, NASA, the, the astronauts had typically come from military backgrounds, but not always the case here. 1987, first African-American female admitted to NASA astronaut program. And in 1992, first African-American female in space aboard the space shuttle Endeavor. Right, and so she is going to be extremely uh, accomplished and recognized uh, for her efforts over the years um, in a variety of capacities and institutions here. So she has several honorary doctorates uh, in 1988, uh, Essence Science and Technology Award, Ebony Black Achievement Award in 92, Montgomery Fellowship at Dartmouth College, uh, Gamma Sigma Gamma, Woman of the Year in 1990, and in 1992, um, a school uh, in her name was created in uh, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. Further on, uh, she is also uh, very active in a variety of memberships as well. So uh, she is a very well-rounded, uh, very um, well learned and uh, she has a variety of interests here as well. And so just a little video clip here. We've got a little video clip uh, that I would like you to uh, watch. I grew up in the 60s. I lived on the south side of Chicago, and I was a young girl who loved to stare up at the stars. I imagined myself going there. I studied all the things about the Apollo program. I knew what mission was going to take place when, what it was supposed to accomplish. I decided to go to medical school because I wanted to do something called biomedical engineering. While I was in medical school, I had the opportunity to go and work in a Cambodian refugee camp. I went on to study group in Cuba. I worked with the flying doctors in East Africa. But I still wanted to go into space, so I applied. I picked up the phone. I called down the Johnson Space Center. I said, I would like an application to be an astronaut. They didn't laugh. 
I turned in the application. There may be a certain naivete when I say, when I applied to the astronaut program, I didn't even think about the fact of whether I would be the first African-American woman in space or anything like that. It didn't even cross my eye I wanted to go into space. I couldn't have cared if there had been a thousand people in space before me or whether there had been none, I wanted to go. I thought it was important to take to space with me things that represented people who sometimes are not included. So I took a poster of Judith Jameson performing the dance cry. I took up a Bundu statue, which was for the Women's Society in West Africa. I took up a flag for the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, the oldest African-American women's sorority in the United States, because they hadn't been included. And I thought that was an important thing to do. For me, the experience was one that made me feel very connected with the universe. I felt that my being was as much a part of this universe as any star, as any comet. It helped me to recognize that right now, we're in space. This Earth is part of that universe. That was my grand connection. And then I looked down and I saw Chicago. I thought about the little girl who had assumed she would go into space. What would my younger self have thought if she met me? And I think she would have been tickled. All right, any, any thoughts, any uh, feedback to that? If you do go to Chicago, um, and if you've been to Chicago, they do have a planetarium there, as well as the Science and Industry Museum. And there is a, um, a section of that museum dedicated to space. Um, and uh, she had mentioned the Apollo mission and definitely uh, there is a uh, Apollo um, mission capsule at the Science and Industry um, Museum there. So, uh, you know, when I think about, uh, you know, just that from that little video clip, my takeaway from that little video clip, and in many ways, is she was very thoughtful, very purposeful in um, what she was uh, doing. And um, she may not have, like she said, she may not have thought about being like the first African-American uh, for NASA, but um, once she is there, she becomes very purposeful in uh, her goal. And she had an idea, in addition to be an astronaut, uh, there is also some social uh, justice or activism that went along with that as well. All right, so just something to think about, okay? Um, and those at home, you can always put stuff in the chat. Okay, so on your um, assignment, so if I bring that up here for a moment, let's take a look here, all right. With that assignment, this question right here, why did Americans oppose U.S. involvement in European affairs? Now, this is the link that I was told that uh, wasn't working on uh, the iPad. And you might've found another way to, to do it, maybe on your phone or at home, you had uh, used a different device uh, to find the answer. So I want us to watch that little clip. Uh, and then think about, you know, why did Americans oppose U.S. involvement in European affairs? All right, and we can answer, we'll answer that one um, together. Okay. All right. So let me get back here. Oh, I always do that. All right, so here I want to share this tab. So this is it. And Charles Lindbergh. Where is where's Charles Lindbergh from? Where was he born? Have you ever been to Little Falls, Minnesota? Which is just past, you know, it's up there past uh, St. Cloud, up there. Uh, Charles Lindbergh Jr., this guy, who was the guy who crossed the Atlantic, first person to fly solo across the Atlantic. He was born in Minnesota, you know, and sometimes we always like, if you're born in Minnesota, we claim you. Even though you may have only lived here a few years, we're going to claim you. All right. He lived here through uh, some of his teenage years. 
Uh, his dad was uh, very active in, in politics um, in Minnesota before uh, Charles Lindbergh exits um, Minnesota. All right, so I wanna watch this little video clip here. So let me mute my mic. At the Manhattan Center, hundreds attend a rally. Tonight's speaker is a famed aviator and American hero, Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh is a Nazi sympathizer, avid opponent of US involvement in the overseas conflict. France has now been defeated, and despite the propaganda and confusion of recent months, it is now obvious that England is losing the war. I believe... The call is to abandon America's friend and ally. And I have been forced to the conclusion that we cannot win this war for England regardless of how much assistance we send. That is why the America First Committee has been formed. Lindbergh and the National America First Committee rail against any involvement in the war. Hundreds of thousands of citizens agree. Since the war began in 1939, Americans have seen and heard about the devastation in Europe. Adolf Hitler's all-out attack on Poland makes the long-dreaded European war a certain. But many are convinced that stopping Adolf Hitler is not worth the sacrifice of American lives. This time America should keep out, and I know I will. I'm the finest dog here of European affairs. I think we should stay out of it entirely. And all our efforts should be made to keep out of the fight. Let Europe fight our own battles. They mean nothing to us. Some Americans publicly admire the Nazis and envision a fascist America. In February 1939, some 20,000 American Nazis rally in Madison Square Garden. All right. Um, so the question was, uh, you know, why? Why did Americans oppose U.S. involvement in European affairs? Um, why did we? Why did we? Either at home or here. Why? Why did we? Wasn't worth risking American lives. Okay. Wasn't worth uh, risking American lives. They didn't want to sacrifice American lives. All right. So that. Someone had said in the chat as well. So that's that's one reason. How about another reason? Some of them were, well, were sympathizers with the Nazis. So they would obviously oppose any sort of involvement with England. Okay, that, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, some opposed it uh, because they were simply sympathetic. All right, good. Okay, this... It was a, a not a winnable fight, all right? And so, um, you know, should that be enough? I guess I have to say, you're walking into a fight, is that is enough to kind of convince you uh, to um, stay out of it? But yes, um, it's not winnable. They've seen the newsreels. <laughs> They're like, oh my gosh, this blitzkrieg is just incredible here. All right, is there any other reasons? You know, I think another one that was mentioned that it was, you know, it's just, it's not our affair. It's not our battle. It's over there in Europe, you know, um, it doesn't, it doesn't impact us. And so that's part of this idea of America first is, um, at least then was this idea. It, it does, it just doesn't concern us. Uh, the reality is, um, uh, we are part, we are in the sights of Nazi Germany, whether we want to believe it or not. There was uh, a manuscript that was found that was called uh, Zweites Buch, um, or the secret book. And uh, in there, there was another phase to Adolf Hitler's uh, game plan. Um, his game plan was to rearm, uh, was to en uh, engage in... Um, lightning war against France and 
uh, France's Eastern allies, um, form an alliance though with uh, Italy and uh, so, uh, not Soviet Union, excuse me, uh, Great Britain, which was interesting. And then a third phase was to take on the, uh, the Soviets because Hitler, not only is he fighting a, he has a, ra a race, racial ideology, he also has a political ideology opposing uh, communism. And then the fourth phase was going to be against the United States. Uh, that was spelled out in a manuscript known as uh, the Secret Book or Svitis Wu that would be discovered later. So eventually, you know, the United States was going to be part of it. I think what some people are surprised is by the amount of individuals in the United States that might be sympathetic to the Nazis. And um, there is a committee that's going to be formed known as the, the House uh, Committee for Un-American Activities in the war. We're going to try to find out who our fascists are. After the war, we're going to try to find who our commies are in the United States. Uh, but uh, there is a number of known fascists that will be in the United States, and um, some of them will be deported at the end of this war. Okay, so there we go. We have that little clip here. All right. Um, now, in your activity, uh, you're looking at a number of events. And that last event that uh, really brings us to war, all right, December 7th, 1941, we declare we, uh, we are, will be attacked. And then the day after, we're going to declare war. So I've got a little video clip here on uh, Pearl Harbor, but it has some special meanings or it has a number of meanings to it. Um, those who are living there in uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, so in the U.S. territory of Hawaii, but then also um, puts in a perspective of this conflict as well. So let's let's watch this little video clip here and uh, see if we got some takeaways. Let me mute here. Pearl Harbor was a Sunday. Pearl Harbor was a Sunday. And together with the family, we're all getting ready to go to church. And the disc jockey is going on with Hawaiian music. And suddenly, he sounded hysterical. For a moment, I thought this was an act. So I stepped out into the street, and sure enough, there are puffs and smoke coming out of that Pearl Harbor area. And so I called my father out, said, look at that. And all of a sudden, three aircraft flew right overhead. They were pearl gray with red dots. I knew what was happening. And I thought my world had just come to an end. Seven fifty-five a.m. on Sunday, December 7, 1941. Hundreds of Japanese warplanes, launched from aircraft carriers far out at sea, attacked the American Pacific Fleet, anchored at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The attack took a terrible toll. So terrible a toll that the War Department kept secret the exact details for years. Eight battleships, including the USS Arizona, three light cruisers, three destroyers, and four other naval vessels were either sunk or damaged. One hundred and sixty-four American aircraft were also destroyed. Most hadn't even gotten off the ground. 
and 2,403 Americans were dead. Nothing like this had ever happened to the United States of America before. Okay, so nothing like this ever happened to the United States before, but has it happened to us since? Yeah, it has. It has. Um, we have to look at 9-11. Uh, as the next time we really have a an event that will have that much that many um, casualties with it and so we're going to use we'll use pearl harbor um, as in many ways kind of a justification for how we act and how we behave um, throughout what becomes known as the cold war um, because uh, we're just gonna never, we're gonna say we can never have another pearl harbor um, and so throughout the Cold War, that's going to kind of guide us. And then um, uh, when the Cold War gets done, uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, the United States has gone through a little evaluation of how to, how to maintain a little sense of security and such with that. Um, anything in that little video clip that kind of stands out? I think I look at that one and Daniel Inouye, Daniel Inouye is uh, the older gentleman that was talking in there. And he said he knew his world um, would never be the same. Why would he say that? What do you think he's getting at? What do you think he's getting at? At home, you can put into the chat. Um, what's he getting at when he says my my world will never uh, my world was going to change? I mean, for the United States, we're at war. We're going to be at war. So yeah, that's going to change. But Daniel, anyway, kind of represents. Um, a small segment of our population we could probably say like 130,000 to maybe 150,000 um, living in di different parts of the, of the United States and territories. He is of um, Japanese uh, descent. And so he knows he would fit in the category of, of what they call a Nisai. So Japanese American um, uh, second generation. Uh, Isai being a Japanese alien, um, he knew that this war is going to change perhaps how people perceive him. During this war, the United States will have what is known as the Japanese internment camps. All right. And so um, that, that will be highlighted in one of our, our, our activity tomorrow. Um, one of the groups being highlighted in the activity for tomorrow. So uh, that definitely is a big change. And Daniel, anyway, after the war, you know, he, he's going to serve uh, in a NISA unit in this war, and he'll eventually go on to become a U.S. senator from the state of Hawaii. Because once Hawaii is going to eventually become a state. Anyone know when Hawaii becomes a state? Hawaii and Alaska are going to come in the same year, um, 1959. 1959. I always thought it was kind of unique. I'm going to uh, go off on a tangent here. My, my grandfather for many years would always fly his uh, 48 state flag. And I'm like, Grandpa, there's 50 states. He's like, I know. That's a good flag. I'm not going to get rid of it. I mean, that's, that's a de depression era thought too. Uh, again, he's the guy who never threw stuff away. And so he's not going to get rid of that 48 star flag. Um, eventually he does get a 50 star flag because, you know, we're going to buy one. It's like, come on, man. We got, we, you need him. But still, uh, Hawaii. Uh, so if we look at this war, uh, there will be uh, some U.S. 
territory because we would say U.S. territory wasn't attacked in, in um, uh, that much in the Second World War, War. At least the mainland, the 48 states. Ships are being sunk off our coast. People could see them being sunk off our coast. But if you lived in an American territory overseas, uh, like Hawaii, Guam, uh, Philippines, uh, the war is going to come to your doorstep. It's going to be right there. Alaska, even Alaska, the war will come to Alaska in the Aleutian Islands. Okay, so that that symbolizes our entrance into the war. I'm sure the British and and um, uh, the British allies are like, finally, the United States is off the fence and is in this conflict. Uh, and so. One could argue, though, that the United States has already been very, very active prior to Pearl Harbor and engaging in what we might call an armed neutrality in terms of how we are trading with some countries and assisting some countries. All right. So remember, your task is to get this assignment done. All right. All right. So this assignment... Uh, and remember your big historical questions here at the end. We get there. All right. These are acting up a little strange here, but that's all right. You have three historical questions at the end, kind of looking at um, the United States' role in the world then as well as today. After First World War, the United States had resorted back to isolationism. And some look at that as a criticism and maybe a, a factor that contributed to uh, what eventually becomes the Second World War. After this war, we are not going to go away. We're going to stay active in the world and in some era, some during some decades, more active than others. All right. So get you to think about that. All right, so task for you is for the remainder of the class period is let's get this thing uh, done and uh, submit it. Ultimately, 11.59 p.m., get it done and submit it, but very well can get it done and submit it today, all right? So with that, those at home can stay on or exit and have a great day. Those here, let's work on this. Let's get her done.